services connecting to the world. From Abuja, Nigeria's capital territory, this is Around News Live. This is MBN Network Media News for all races connecting to the world. African Counter-Terrorism Summit in Abuja amid increasing threat on the continent. Protests rock all Progressive Congress governorship primary as some candidates call for the cancellation of the exercise. And the United States House of Representatives approves $61 billion in new U.S. military aid for Ukraine to help combat Russia's invasion. After the gruesome murder of 17 army personnel in Okwama community of Delta State, the Nigerian military has lost six of its gallant men in yet another attack, this time to terrorists who laid an ambush for the soldiers in Shororo local government area of Niger State, killing two officers and four soldiers. Now, the Director of Army Public Relations, Major General Oyema Wachiku, in a statement today, says the troops were ambushed while on a fighting patrol to Karaga village in Shororo local government area. According to the statement, the troops from the 1 Division of the Nigerian Army were ambushed by terrorists on Friday, April the 19th, during which they fought gallantly through the ambush and eliminated several of the terrorists and has captured some of their equipment. Now, following the setback, the General Officer Commanding 1 Division and Commander Operation World Punch, Major General Landa Saraso, on behalf of the Chief of Army Staff, has sympathized with the families of the dead personnel and assured them that the perpetrators will be brought to book. In line with military customs and traditions, the Nigerian Army Authority has already contacted the next of kings of the fallen heroes, while burial has been conducted for the late Muslim personnel with the consent and approval of their family members. The GOC said the troops are currently trailing some of the terrorists who survived and fled after the encounter, is therefore urging the residents of Niger State to go about their legitimate and lawful activities, reassuring them that the Nigerian Army and other security agencies will ensure their protection at all times. Meanwhile, at least three persons have been reportedly killed, while several others injured, as bandits invaded a market in Safay Town, headquarters of Safay local government area of Zamfara State. I have an eyewitness account told General Sanvision that the bandits stormed the market around 11 a.m. today and opened fire on the marketers. The spokesperson of the Nigerian police in Zafara State, ESP Yazid Abubakar, who confirmed the attack to Channel's television, so the actual number of casualties in the attack is yet to be ascertained. Mr. Abubakar adds that the joint military and police forces were deployed to the scene to engage the bandits and normalcy had been returned to the area. And in Abia State, the State Police Command has arrested and placed under house arrest a corporal who shot and killed an above businessman. The State Pub Pub Police Public Relations Officer Maureen Chinaka in a statement says the police officer will soon face appropriate disciplinary measures. She expressed her sympathy to the victim's family and assured that they would be included in any future inquiries into the situation. On Wednesday, while driving home along about where he wrote, the victim, Mr. Emmanuel Okocha of Abriba in Ohafia local government area, was reportedly approached by policemen at a checkpoint who asked him for money, which he allegedly rejected. The businessman suffered fatal injuries after the trigger-happy police officer shot him during the ensuing altercation. He reportedly died on Friday night after being taken to a hospital in the state capital. 
Port Harcourt, the river state capital, is one of the cities in the country with strong economic viabilities. However, recent reports of political crisis and pockets of kidnap cases have raised some concerns in the state. Our correspondent, Deborah Agbalama, in this next report, explores the nightlife in Port Harcourt and its environs. As daylight fades into darkness, individuals venture out for various reasons, seeking livelihood, fulfilling duty obligations, or simply unwinding after a day's work. Now, how safe is nightlife in Port Harcourt, given its significant economic contributions to the country? We begin our findings at the River State University Teaching Hospital, where essential workers like Dr. Gilbert Dede face security challenges during their night shifts. A colleague of mine um, was actually um, in a car where her phone and her pulse was taken while she was going to work. You know, it was a very terrible experience for her. We meet Mr. Hope Idozo, owner of multiple leisure sports, who attests to the improved safety of nightlife in Port Harcourt, although with extra security measures in place. As you can see, there are lots of clubs like new clubs and lounges and you know, and other businesses as well are private. A lot of people, I think, I think it's 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 very safe now. The, the police is doing a good job. There's um, the kidnapping rates and all that has dropped drastically. To verify these claims, we venture out on a Friday night ride, encountering busy policemen on stop and search duties. However. Our observation reveals inadequate security lighting in certain areas, posing potential security risks. Further insights come from Valentine Omomelo, who is popularly known as the instigator of PH, who highlights a drastic reduction in kidnapping incidents, attributing it to government and police efforts. As at the 2006-2007, when you had the militant issue, it was bad, it was very bad. Once it's six o'clock, there's no one outside. But for now, during the weekends uh, administration, things became better. Now the football rights is here now. I think it's much better though. To understand law enforcement strategies firsthand, we visit Commissioner of Police, Olatun Jidisu, who after taking us to the control room, where emergency calls are handled, outlines initiatives to combat criminal activities and offers safety advice for nocturnal activities. You must make sure that you rest in the thing. You must make sure and that also iron is being recovered. You must make sure that the odons are being arrested in the command. Things should be better by now because then uh, we have increased our presence in all bus stops. We have police officers moving around. Tell somebody before you leave home. Tell somebody where you are going to. Let your phone be available for you to call and for them to call you. Have the phone number of your police station. It is very, very important. All police stations have phone number and the phone number of the control room. <laughs> Tinubu will on Monday, April the 22nd, declare open a two-day African counter-terrorism summit in Abuja. A statement by the Special Advisor on Media and Publicity to the President, Ajuri Galali, says the objective of the high-level summit is to enhance multilateral counter-terrorism cooperation and reshape the international community's collective response to terrorism in Africa. With the theme, strengthening regional cooperation and institution building to address the evolving threat of terrorism, the summit will also focus on providing African-led and African-owned solutions to the multifaceted threat of terrorism on the continent. Expected to attend are heads of state and government across Africa, representatives of international organizations and multilateral institutions, including the UN Deputy Secretary General, Mrs. Amina Mohamed, 
members of the diplomatic corps, as well as civil society groups. The National Security Advisor, Mano Nuvurubadu, and the Under Secretary General of the United Nations Office for Counterterrorism, Mr. Vladimir Voronkov, will deliver the closing remarks. The summit is organized in partnership with the United Nations Office on Counterterrorism. Quality leadership is one of the primary ingredients in nation building. That's the view of the founder of Stambik IBTC, Mr. Tedo Peterside. He raises concerns that more of what is seen now is selfishness by leaders across strata. Mr. Peterside revealed this while speaking with Channel Television's Susan Iliar. All my efforts are concentrated largely in whatever I can do in several ways, some behind the scenes, to help improve my country. I think in Nigeria that's a leadership challenge. I'm talking generally, I'm not talking about one person. It's across the states, across local governments. So every day I do everything I can. You know, and we've got other people working with other people to try and influence things in the direction of the type of improved leadership that Nigeria needs. Because that's the key. I know people talk about, okay, but you can only get good leaders if you have good followers. You may be right, but I beg to disagree. In Nigeria, there are many, many very good followers. The problem is leadership is not good enough. Let's call the speed is speed. I'm talking about leadership that is by example. It's too easy to make pronouncements that you don't live by yourself. I've said it repeatedly and I'll say it one more time. Nigerians don't believe in do as I say, they believe in do as I do. If you are doing something yourself, they'll take you seriously and they'll buy into it. But if you're exempting yourself, exempting your family, living a, a, a sort of family, a profligate existence, they will take you seriously. And that's not a presidential statement. It applies in local government. It applies in state governments. There are state government governors that nobody takes seriously, even in their own states. There are state governors that everybody takes seriously, almost everybody takes seriously. For more on that exclusive conversation, after several months of depreciation, Nigeria's currency, the Naira, has struggled its way back to recovery against major foreign currencies, particularly the US dollar. This development has sparked discussions on the implications for Nigeria's economic landscape. But this report delves into the impact of the Naira of the Naira's rebound against its peers as well as on the country's economy. The Nigerian Naira, like many other currencies, experiences fluctuations influenced by various domestic and international factors. After breaching the 1,000 Naira threshold for the first time of the official foreign exchange market on December the 8th, 2023, the local currency went on to lose 37.6% of its value in January 2024 alone, and had been on the steady decline against other foreign currencies for more than two months. But hope was not lost for the Naira, as the Central Bank of Nigeria swiftly implemented a series of policy measures in an effort to promote transparent pricing in the foreign exchange market and tackle liquidity issues. In response, the local currency unit made a rebound on its recovery effort, firming to 1,136 Naira against the dollar in the official forex market and 1,050 Naira at the parallel market on April the 15th, all the way from 1,830 Naira level, which it exchanged against the dollar in February this year. But are Nigerians feeling the impact of the local currency's rebound? There are some people that are buying when the dollar is at the rate of 1.6. One seven, and now the dollar is at the rate of one one. You know, the goods is still there, so the way to sell it will be a difficult thing. But we still thank God for everything. But we pray that the government will help us to make the naira stable. The effect of the rebound is going to come into June, July, or thereabouts, so that by that time, the money is that people changed into the current rate that has come down, the ripple effect would have been coming into the market. But as it is now, it is a slight difference from what uh, was like two weeks ago. Because the monies that people will change to send 
abroad are still the effect is still in the market. That's what I'm trying to explain. So what needs to be done to ensure the local currency stability? I still look forward to a positive move on the side of Naira against other currencies. By the time um, we, we begin to see positive moves from the real sector in terms of our production, you understand, by the time the likes of Dangote refinery starts full operation, and we can put an end to importation of major pe uh, petroleum products, and we begin to, to buy in Naira within our own economy, you know, that will reduce the demand of forex for those products that we import. The CBN has said that it plans to collaborate with the Ministry of Finance to stabilize the exchange rate and implement inflation-taming policies. Economic analysts say the freefall of the Naira has helped fuel inflation to a nearly two-decade high in recent months and exacerbating the cost of living prices and weighing on the domestic economy. Meanwhile, analysts at U.S. investment bank Goldman Sachs expects that the Naira will extend its gains beyond the 1,000 Naira exchange rate threshold. For now, that forecast is being awaited by Nigerians with much anticipation. In part two, after the break, the Hallmarks of Labour Foundation celebrates Nigerians, Africans and other great achievers at its 27th anniversary and awards ceremony. Please stay with us. Media news for our races connecting you to the world. Welcome back. You have just joined us to watch the next. Terrorists kill six soldiers in an ambush in Shiroro, local government area of Niger State, as military authorities vow to bring perpetrators to book. Niger hosts African counterterrorism summit in Abuja amid increasing threats on the continent. Protests rock all progressive Congress governorship primary as some candidates call for the cancellation of the exercise. And the United States House of Representatives approves $61 billion in new U.S. military aid for Ukraine to help combat Russia's invasion. for the Nigerian government at the end of the World Bank IMF spring meetings is how to diversify the nation's economy, improve revenue generation, and cut the costs of governance. Minister of Finance, Mr. Wale Adu, and the central bank governor, Yemi Cardozo, who spoke with journalists at the end of the spring meetings, explained that Nigeria has secured a $2.25 billion facility from the World Bank at a 1% interest rate over a 40-year period. Our correspondent, Sarah Achimogu, who has been covering the spring meetings, has this report. The past few days have seen countries of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund given reasons why countries must continue to redouble efforts to place the countries on the path of economic growth. The meeting is over, but the Nigerian government is speaking on the gains and its next level of action. We have qualified for uh, um, the processing um, just this week to the board of directors of the World Bank of a total package of $2.25 billion of what you can call. I mean, the, 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 there's, there's no such thing as a free lunch, but it's the closest you can get to free money. It's virtually a grant. It's for about 40 years, 10 years moratorium at about 1% interest. So, um, that also is part of, uh, of, of the flow that you, you can count. We had very productive discussions with leading international money transfer operators, INGOs, where we collectively committed to doubling remittance flows through formal channels into Nigeria in the immediate short to medium term. This target is both ambitious and achievable, and we are wasting no time in setting up a collaborative task force, reporting to myself, to drive progress and address any bottlenecks that hinder flows through formal channels. 
Both the central bank governor and the Ministry of Finance are showing Nigeria is overbalanced from the monetary and the fiscal sides. This according to their own backed by sound policies. The issue of supply of foreign exchange to the Nigerian economy, um, we are, the government is looking at um, attracting those funds and capturing those funds through a diaspora um, type of instrument, a diaspora bond. We think that would be a very attractive uh, instrument for Nigerians abroad and for foreign holdings of uh, foreign currency. It will have a determined pathway and a sequence approach to tackling all challenges ahead, working hand in hand with our key stakeholders, including investors, banks, businesses, and notably our counterparts on the fiscal side. I think the most important thing to say here is that we are doing everything possible to ensure that we have a stable exchange rate and an exchange rate that, is, that, that finds it's an adequate price to stop the level. The week-long spring meeting of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund has been quite engaging. Discussions centered around building buffers to withstanding economic shocks and reducing debt burdens, as well as sustaining financial inclusion among member countries. Policymakers from Nigeria are hoping to match words with actions in the days ahead to improve the livelihood of many. From Washington, D.C., Sarah Chiu. Earlier this week, the Bureau of Statistics, that's Nigeria's Bureau of Statistics, released the latest inflation report. Consumer price inflation is not only a measure of how fast or slow prices of goods change. Inflation statistics is vital in the decisions taken by private and public institutions. Tonight, Babajido Busso, founder of Leadership by Data and Channels Television, this is here to share insights on what a 33.2% inflation rate means. Babajide, great to have you again on the news at 10. Good evening, Naya Tunde. So let's get into it. Of course, the central bank has uh, kept increasing uh, the monetary policy rate as a means of uh, reducing rising inflation. Uh, is there any proof that this is actually working? In the short term, we still don't have proof that the monetary policy um, rate of change of monetary policy is significantly affecting infl inflation rates. But I have to have three questions Nigerians are asking similar to this. The first question is, why is the monetary policy rate not really influencing inflation rates? And the answer is simple. Monetary policy as a tool globally cannot exclusively be used to bring down inflation rates. For countries that even use monetary policy rates, those countries often have what is in economic terms are classified as efficient markets. Does Nigeria have an efficient market? The answer is no. And so the monetary policy rate is not the El Dorado. We cannot legislate inflation rates to come down. So that answers the first question, which is why is the monetary policy rate not bringing down the inflation rates? Right, the second question Nigerians are asking is, now that inflation is 33.2%, Nigerians are asking when will inflation come back to single digits? And I'll give you the answer, Ayo. The way to approach this is to understand when last did Nigeria have inflation as high as 33.2%? The answer is in, in, the, in our history books, March 1996. Before March 1996, which other period did Nigeria have inflation rate as high as 33%? Again, our history books tells us 1976 and 1977. The insight here is in 1996, when we had inflation rate as high as 33%, 1976 and 1977, we had military rulers. General Sani Abacha in 1996, General Obasanjo in 76 and 77. The point I'm making here today is that never in Nigeria's history have we had a civilian president govern when inflation was as high as 33%. In simple terms, President Tinumbu is Nigeria's first civilian president that has the responsibility of bringing inflation down when it has, is as high as 33%. So whatever happens, this clearly will be a case study not only for Nigerian universities, for international 
universities, good or bad. Now, to the third and perhaps most important question, what should the government be doing next? And even though the government, yes, has made a lot of positive efforts, what is important is for us right now to have a reliable database of farm produce. In simple terms, what I'm talking about is we need to know who produces what, where, in what quantity, and when. That reliable database of farm produce will clearly allow us to make plans into the future about how to clearly manage the rising prices of food, which clearly is a significant reason why inflation is going out of control. Now we've sorted this out. The next thing is for us to clearly understand what these numbers mean. And in looking at how a lot of people have interpreted these numbers, a lot of these interpretations are wrong. And I'll explain why. Listen carefully to this. Two figures, as an example, 10% and 20%. We need to make a distinction between the rate of value change and the rate of percentage change. And I'll explain what I mean. 10% to 20%, that's a difference of, in terms of value, 10%. But in terms of percentage change, it's 100%. And I'll explain what I mean. If you were to take a loan of 100 naira at an interest rate of 10%, the interest you'll have to pay back will be 10 naira. If I were to take a loan, same loan of 100 naira, and I were to pay an interest of 20%, the interest I'll have to pay back will be 20 naira. In simple terms, my interest payments will be double yours. And so we need to understand that 10% to 20%, in terms of value, is 10%. But in terms of percentage change, it is 100%. So tonight, I'd like us to take a look at a concept called how much is Nigeria's inflation rate inflating? In simple terms, how much is the strength of this inflation? And yes, if you look at the numbers we have today in March, 33% inflation rate compared to what it was last year in value terms. However, in percentage terms, it is 51%. Again, using the example I told you, looking at what it was in percentage terms this time last year and what it is this year. And so 51% is how much is Nigeria's inflation rate inflating, the test of the strength of inflation, 51%. Now, those numbers are extremely dear for the common man. And so 33% allows us to see it on an annual basis. However, for us to test the strength of the inflation, again, how much is Nigeria's inflation rate inflating? That is the answer in front of you, 51%. Robert, uh, let's, let's talk about the issue of pricing now. I mean, how much are prices rising, in, 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 of course, in the world's more uh, developed economies? You talk about issues such as uh, changing uh, global trade dynamics uh, and what have you. What can you tell us about that? So you're correct. Um, the changing global dynamics, geopolitics, um, potential is potentially just, and actually disrupting trade flows. We could take a look at it in very many ways, but one way to look at it is how much is inflation affecting the world's most populated countries? How much impact are citizens feeling from the rising price of living in, in simple terms? People cause cause call the situation we face globally a cost of living crisis, chaos everywhere. So if we take a look at the top 10 countries in the world that have the highest population, to find out how different is Nigeria from the rest of the world in terms of countries with the sort of populations that are even higher, we find that Nigeria still is an outlier. India, China, annual rate of inflation 4.8% in China, less than 1%, you heard me clearly. In the last one year, average prices of goods in China have risen by less than 1%. In the US, 3.5%, Indonesia, 3%, Pakistan, approximately 21%, Nigeria, 33%, an extreme outlier. Brazil, Bangladesh, Russia, Mexico, all inflation, annual inflation rates of less than 10%. So clearly, if you look at what is in front of you, Nigeria, current consumer price inflation stands significantly apart from the, the average of the top 10 most populated countries, and even significantly higher when we look at what else, else is going on along developing countries. But well, Anthony, well, here's what, yes it is, but here's why this is important. You know, the inflation rates 
is a measure of price stability. Price stability is a measure of your income stability. Your income stability is a measure of your survival stability. And if you ask millions of Nigerians, your survival stability is a measure of your family stability. So the right question we need to ask ourselves is, if families are unstable, can the, ninth, like, can the country be stable? Which brings me to the last question, of course, uh, the outlook for inflation. What is it going to look like for the second quarter of the year? There's some good news, but there's some bad news out today. Which should we start with? Let's start with the bad news. Go ahead. Tonight isn't about me talking about the performance of the former president or the current president. We'll do that in another 40 days, and we'll do that extensively. But I'd like to share an important fact with you. In President Wari's eight years, that's 96 months, never in those 96 months did food inflation, you heard me right, food inflation measured month-on-month -month basis, never did it exceed 3%. It never even got to 3%. Based on the National Bureau of Statistics report, let's take a look at what food inflation has been only in the first three months of this year. And in their report, they show that in January, food inflation 3.2%, February 3.8%, March 3.6%. Politically, this is, these are not the sort of numbers President Tinubu would love to see again because his predecessor had 96 months and in none of those months did food inflation on a month by month basis hit three percent all right Tony here to the good news you know a wise man once said and listen carefully to this he said hunger we get hope no they kill person I'll repeat that again hunger we get hope no they kill person so a lot of Nigerians still have hope However, the question that we need to now ask ourselves is how much hope does a common man still have? Actually, that's a big question, of course. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> how much hope do we have? I mean, of course, when you're uh, not battling with hunger, you know, there's still a big chance of survival. But never forget what you're trying to say. Hunger, we get hope. No, they kill us. We'll leave it at that. But what you do is all. Thank you so much. Reports on the news at 10. The pleasure is all mine. Still ahead on the news at 10. U.S. House approves critical $61 billion aid package for Ukraine, a new boost for the country to fight Russia invasion. Please join us again. <laughs> This is NBN Network Media, news for all races, connecting you to the world. Welcome back. Collection of results is currently ongoing in the Odo ABC governorship primary, which took place across the state on Saturday. Meanwhile, some members of the All Progressives Congress in Akure are protesting what they describe as irregularities and biased conduct of the governorship primary across which took place or which took place across the state of course, on a Saturday. Now, the ward of primaries meant to produce the governorship candidate of the party has been marked with non-availability of election materials, and some are, and some of the aspirants are already calling for the cancellation of the exercise. It was a broad daylight robbery, a monumental disaster. ABC sent some delegates here to conduct a primary election. Apparently, that was never done. They remained on a press here at the hotel and started writing results. They wrote the results of 203 words all across the state, writing the mandate, taking the mandate of the people into their own hands. At the end of the day, we, start, we started seeing different results flying around stating one particular candidate won the election. And that, that never happened. In the whole of 203 words in the state, there was no election at all. The, uh, there was a guideline of what to do during the election. The members were registered. Um, the electoral officers uh, member being accredited. None of them. No electoral officer, no membership card, no membership card.
of Representatives member for Undo East and Undo West Federal Constituency, Honorable Viola Makide, says the turnout for the APC primaries across Undo State was impressive. Speaking on our political program, Sunday Politics, Honorable Makide explains that all concerned parties in the exercise can attest to its peaceful conduct. We had a massive, massive turnout of voters uh, committed to um, vote for the right choice of um, the aspirant. So the, the, whole, the whole exercise was, was good. The uh, police um, and the law enforcement officers were around. The INEC officer uh, was monitor the exercise throughout. And, you know, this is uh, an election where all the card carrying, card carrying members of APC uh, were called to um, actually um, choose their uh, candidates and um, the whole thing went very well. I was there myself. We voted in the West, we voted seven, and the, the, the turnout was massive and uh, it, was, it, was, it was good. And so, once we don't have such a record for the law enforcement, and we don't have any such record for my neck as well, and even us who are voters, I, I don't know where they're coming out from. Rewarding excellence through hard work by identifying role models that can inspire for success as motivation for the hallmarks of Labour Foundation. This formed the thrust of the 27th anniversary and Great Nigerian Awards 2024 by the Hallmarks of Labour Foundation, which held at the Oriental Hotel in Lagos. Uh, amongst the awardees are the Minister of Health, Ali Patin, former Minister of State for Petroleum, Odin Ajumogobia, and former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jeffrey Onyama. Our correspondent, Ulumide Makoli, reports. An assembly of achievers make up the awardees and invited participants as the procession mounts the podium to the orchestral music by students of the Risan School of Music. The voice of broadcasting aficionado Femi Sholu lights up the event as former Secretary General of the Commonwealth and Chairman Board of Trustees of Hallmarks of Labor Foundation, Chief Emeka Yanku, bids the guests welcome, followed by the Executive Secretary of the Foundation, Patricia Chodun Arawari. <laughs>
students of the Musong School of Music serenade the guests further. Also receiving an award is Professor Rukiyatu Ahmed Rafai for the HLF role model for consistent advocacy for education for the girl child. The HLF Award for Excellence in Leadership and Good Governance goes to Ambassador Odein Ajumogobia, while Barrister Nandi Banefo receives the HLF Lifetime Achievement Award for Exemplary Courageous Service to the Advancement of the Legal System. Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Femi Falano, reads the citation for awards presented to Basharu Jayekofolaro Randall and Ambassador Geoffrey Oyama. Professor Umaru Pate receives the Christopher Kolade Award for Excellence in Leadership and Professionalism in the Media, presented by Chairman Channels Media Group, Dr. John Momo. Professor Mohammed Ali Pate, Minister of Health, receives the Role Model Award for Outstanding Contributions in the Field of Medicine with Professor Adiola Kuni. And the Young Achievers Award for the Best Performing School in the West African School Certificate Examination 2023. Photo ops in the moment of good cheer after the presentations and reactions from some of the awardees. It's nice to be you know, rewarded um, or given an award uh, for whatever small contribution. It's obviously a small contribution because there's still so much to be done in the country. The country's in a, in a bit of a mess. Um, and so whatever contribution one has made is just been adding a little bit to Growing, uh, growing our nation, and um, it's, it's, it's everybody's hand has to be on deck, both those in government and those not in government. We all, we can't just point to the president and say the president's responsible. He's not. He's, we're all responsible for making Nigeria a great country, which it can be. We feel very happy, and we have received this award in Mary's and I think that it should just be a form of greater joy for them. Hallmarks of Labour Foundation was established in 1996 to, amongst other objectives, identify Nigerians and others of the black race whose achievements benefit society and use these achievements of the role models to show that success through honest labour is rewarding and fulfilling. Illuminate Macaulay. The of the Presidential Compressed Natural Gas Initiative will be delivered before the end of this year with 600 buses targeted. The special advice on information and strategy to the president, Mr. Bayo Nanuga, who disclosed this in the statement, says the first set of 200 buses will be delivered before the first anniversary of President Bola Tinubu's administration on May the 29th. He notes that 100 conversion workshops and 60 refueling sites spread across 18 states will also be ready before the end of the year 2024. Mr. Nanuga revealed that the first set of critical assets for deployment and launch of the CNG initiative will be delivered before May the 29th. Under the initiative, the federal government targets to get at least 1 million natural gas propelled vehicles on the roads by the year 2027. According to him, while the government has provided the sum of 100 billion naira for the initiative, the private sector has responded with over $50 million in actual investments. He says 80 natural gas vehicle conversion and associated appliances standards are being developed for the country in addition to the development of an app mycng.ng for proper monitoring. Future Past is a solo exhibition by multifaceted artist Tejmola Adenuga. Artist presents over 30 minimalistic drawings and more in a solo show. Well, this exhibition took place at Art 21 Gallery in Lagos. An intriguing personal journey from the old to the new is told in over 30 pieces of work presented by multidisciplinary artist Tejumola Adenuga in this solo exhibition titled Future Past at the Art 21 Gallery in the Co Hotel and Suites, Lagos. This show is a, it's kind of self-descriptive. It's an amalgamation of my past, of 
live in his growing up in Jabode and then moving to London as a teenager. And as a person, as a product of two worlds, I'm trying to find a way to bring them together and to bring them together on a, this uh, fictional context, um, which is where this work has kind of generated itself from. Alongside the pieces are balloons, which form part of the childhood and contemporary memories merged to create this fantasy world where everything works for the creative. To be honest with you, the artwork together that is depicting and explaining all what he has uh, actually written on the wall here, so much make a sense from all what is put together in drawing, painting, you know, it makes a whole lot of sense and that with the balloons, people, not only kids, I see adults yet, trying to make a whole lot of fun out of it, and with the space where they are, they're trying to make life out of it, and, you know, relating with one another. The monochrome pieces fused with the culture and creative tribute done with a minimalistic approach have struck a chord with the audience. What comes through uh, to me in this world is the way he's been able to define the images using as little um, distortion, if you will, of white space as possible. Um, so it comes in sophisticated, it looks very clear, um, and I think, I think, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. The multidisciplinary artist and designer who is based in London is encouraging people to dare to dream and be happy regardless of the challenges life throws at them. Connecting to the world. From Abuja, Nigeria's capital territory, this is Around News Live. This is MBN Network Media News for all races. Connecting to the world. This is MBN Network Media, news for our races connecting you to the world.